Yeah, for me, that moment of revelation, really, that's pay dirt. That's what I'm looking for um, in every visualization. And the difference is that if you just look at raw data, you often will see something mildly interesting. You may have known it before. You know, if you look at, um, you know, inflation, a graph of inflation, um, you'll see it's going up over time. And it's kind of interesting. Um, you sort of knew inflation, you know, it has steadier, so the, the value of a dollar goes down over time. That itself is not so interesting. On the other hand, is if you see something that is showing you something you didn't know is there to begin with. Um, you see complexity that wasn't there. So an example of this for me is uh, when I created the map of the wind with Fernando Villegas. And, you know, we I had this image in my mind of wind just flowing from west to east, basically. And I was like, you know, it can't be quite that simple, but I'm sure that's what, what happens ultimately. And the first time that we actually created visualizations that let us see the full flow of the wind over the U.S., I was shocked. I had no idea that it, you know, traveled in so many different directions. And similarly, when we um, ended up doing a couple of trial visualizations of wind across the world, that was also really interesting because I realized, oh, it goes west to east some places, east to west other places. I immediately remembered, oh, yeah, I learned all about, you know, navigation in the 1500s <laughs> and how, you know, boats would use these winds. And suddenly everything came together for me. And I was like, aha, I see it now. I get it. Um, and that gave me a framework, I think, to help me understand what how the wind works in general. And it helped me understand the details. So to me, I guess, details. So to me, I guess that's the best thing about a feeling of revelation, is that it's not just like, oh, I learned something, but I have a framework for understanding other things that I can sort of snap things into place. Um, a good uh, A good example is when you see a city from the air, the first time that I was in an airplane and looked at cities and looked at clouds, I suddenly realized, oh, okay, clouds actually are three-dimensional in that way. It looked very different. Um, you know, the first time I looked at Manhattan from above, I was like, oh, that's the grid. I'd seen maps, but there was something about seeing it in person that was a moment of revelation. And once you've seen something like that, you can never unsee it. It helps you understand things from then on. That's really good. Yeah, zooming in and out is, on the one hand, it's a very simple technical thing, but I think it has profound consequences. And for me, I like to think of it with a simple phrase, which is, I can see my house from here. Uh, you know, I remember when I was a kid and I would, there was a local mountain near me, not very high, but it gave a decent view, and I would climb it. And the first thing that I would look for when I was at the summit was my house. I just wanted to see it. And even to this day, if, if I'm in an airplane coming at, into Logan Airport, I try to see, oh, can I see my neighborhood? It's really interesting. And the funny thing is, that's just this pervasive impulse across people all over. Um, in the map of the wind across the United States, everyone wants to zoom in right on their area. You know, even if that's not where the most interesting weather is globally, um, you want to know your stuff. Um, I stuff. Um, I did a visualization of baby names, and in that, everyone immediately typed in their own name, their kids' names, their parents' names, and they may eventually branch out into other names. In fact, they almost always do. But that's a special starting point for them. So I think that's is that the overview gives you a framework for thinking about things. Zooming in gives you a way of seeing what is relevant and understanding details. And then once you've seen, OK, I see the overview, I see what's critical for me, that gives you a base where you can sort of explore, understand other details, you have the context you need. So yeah, zooming is critical, uh, absolutely. And in, in, in Sure. There, so there are a couple of boundary conditions with visualization. Uh, one of them is just the number of pixels on the screen. Like just to get round numbers, let's say we have 1,000 pixels by 1,000 pixels. Each one of those pixels has maybe 24 bits of color that you can see. And for a static image, if you think about it, that's not that much. You know, that is maybe three megabytes of information, right? And um, you know, many, many databases are gigabytes. Um, now, we can get around that in a couple of ways. You can animate. Um, so you can show things moving, and that gives you more, more information over time. But even then, you really start to think about, okay, what can your eye perceive? And if you start to think about the bandwidth of your eye, it's not that high, um, and it's not really absorbing that much um, from movement. Uh, another thing you can do is add interaction, and that's really what you have to do to see large databases, um, at least in parts. But in the end, you're never going to see the whole database. Like, there's just not enough bandwidth from the screen to your eyes, and 
there's not really enough bandwidth from your eyes to your brain to get gigabytes in. Um, and probably your brain is not smart enough to think about gigabytes in any fast manner. So I think, so I think that is one of the limits, is that if you have a gigantic database, you know, our brains are finite, our eyes are limited, you know, the computer is limited. There is some scale, and I would say that scale typically is in the millions of items, that anything beyond that, you're just going to see aggregations or computations that the computer has performed. Um, limit. So right now, computers can do certain things very easily. They can add up numbers, they can average them, they can sometimes make guesses about what sentences mean, you know, whether they're happy or sad, but not very accurately. And that's the other kind of limit. Now, I would be... I would feel like I would be crazy if I predicted an algorithmic limit. Computers are gonna get very, very smart. Um, and, and the smarter they get, the faster they'll get smarter, one could surmise, who knows? You know, I, so I don't wanna say there's a limit there, but right now, today, those are the two limits. There's limited bandwidth and computers can only compute certain things to aggregate what you can't see. And you've done I think you know, trying to see thought in any way is completely fascinating. Like, I, I love looking at MRI scans, you know, even though I don't understand them. It's this idea that you have access to something about, you know, how, how we're actually thinking. And, you know, with, with computers, you actually do have access to certain things. And with simple algorithms, like they're beautiful visualizations of sorting algorithms that can help you understand them. Um, with, uh, you know, I, I did a visualization of chess where you can sort of see a computer thinking about chess and it gives you some idea of, just how many moves it's considering, which is, is, is very fun. I think, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I love the idea that we're learning more and more about how the brain works. And I would love to see better visualizations um, of you know, how I myself think. I, I think that would be fascinating. And then approach that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know that the world is thinking. Um, <laughs> it's, it's individual people think, and to the extent that the system can be said to think, that's a really, it's sort of an interesting philosophical question. I think one way that, you know, the system, the, the society at large is like a person, is I feel like there is some notion of attention. Uh, you know, a person will focus their attention on over here, over there, does my knee hurt, you know, is, is my hair wet or something. And I think societies will also focus in that way. And we see that on a bunch of levels. Um, you know, you can look on uh, Google Trends and see what people are querying the search engine for, and it's pretty fascinating. You know, people are very entrained. Things will spike up um, on YouTube at a very kind of mundane level. It's really interesting to see what occupies people's attention. So, you know, we have a, a map that we put on YouTube, YouTube Trends Map, that lets you see what different people have different regions of the U.S. Are, are focusing on at any given point. What are the viral videos? And that's actually very interesting. It sort of gives you an idea of, you know, what, what, what people really care about. Um, and I think that's fascinating. I wish we had more data. Um, I wish we could understand more. At the same time, it's sort of nice that we can't see everything right now. <laughs> I, will... I feel like the internet is, is changing things so much it's almost hard to describe, you know? I mean, just the fact that we uh, interact so much through these little written snippets is unusual. Um, you know, I grew up before email, so even email seems like new technology to me in some ways. And if you think about Twitter or Facebook, the fact that we're all managing multiple audiences at once, it's, it's crazy. Uh, I think in some ways, every person today deals with issues that only celebrities dealt with, you know, several decades ago. So it's, it's a very complicated world. At the same time, you know, it's, it's wonderful. It's like we can communicate across national boundaries in a way that was unthinkable many, many years ago. We can communicate instantly. Um, we're always connected. We have cell phones. It's, you know, I think the velocity with which ideas are spreading is fast. And I think one of the biggest changes um, right now is how much of our time is spent connected so that we're starting to rely on our connections. Uh, we just routinely ask people questions we might not have bothered to ask before. We routinely ask computers questions, look things up in the net um, that we wouldn't have, have before. Um, so, okay, that's a fascinating question. Are we collectively getting smarter or more capable? So there's two ways of interpreting that. One is, if you look at us collectively, it is the best stuff getting better and better? you know, 
Another thing you could look at is, is the average getting better? And another is you could just say, like, look at each individual. Are, are we getting better? Like, conceivably, we could all be getting worse, but something in how we're interacting is actually is making us be better. So I think better or not. I think it's pretty clearly agreed among mathematicians we're in kind of a golden age right now. Like, we are making progress in ways that you know, was impossible a century ago. Um, you know, huge numbers of theorems are being proven, um, very important, you know, conjectures are being resolved. Uh, I think it's, it's really, really amazing. Um, so I would say collectively, maybe yes. Um, certainly other, other things. Now, at the same time, I think there are dangers. You know, you can have a mob mentality. We know there are cases where everyone collectively can think the wrong thing. Um, we have stock market crashes. We have, you know, crazy mobs that, that, that can sort of come up. Um, it's a little bit less clear to me if that's happening more now than it used to. Um, I, I would say in many areas, you see us getting smarter collectively. Um, but I think things get weirder. Um, there's a... a passage in the Tao Te Ching that I think about a lot that goes something like this, that the more clever and crafty the people of the country, the oftener strange things happen. And I think that's sort of the, the situation we're in right now, um, that it's just as with global climate change, not only does the temperature get hotter, that's not a good characterization, the, the weather gets weirder. I feel like that's a little bit what's happening now as, as we all become more capable, is more and more interesting weird things happen um, often. At the same time, I do think there's an interesting question of, in terms of education, am I learning things less deeply because I'm just looking things up? Um, you know, is my memory less developed than it was? Maybe so, but maybe that doesn't matter. I don't know. Maybe it's more important to be able to be a good searcher than a good rememberer. So I, I don't know the answer, but I think it's a very interesting question and a complicated one. It was fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, lol cats. I mean, you know, just thinking about, okay, the whole country going crazy over pictures of cats with like, you know, silly text on them. Now, granted, I have seen things that say, okay, people loved pictures of cute cats 100 years ago and you could order them in catalogs. So that's probably a, a constant in human nature. But watching everyone just sort of compete to put little captions on them, I mean, I love it, don't get me wrong, but it's just peculiar, you, you, you have to admit. Um, yeah, it could be that the rate that information is spreading is, is getting faster and that's causing things to be stranger. Um, or it could just cause other things. I mean, I, I feel like there was a time when I used to sort of pride myself on knowing about developments in visualization before other people I knew did. That time has long passed, you know? It's like, I feel like today when something really interesting comes up, Everyone knows about it within about five minutes because of Twitter and Facebook and, you know, they search for it on Google. You know, it's like things on the web happen very fast. And to the extent that there are obscure things that people haven't discovered yet or like in tiny corners of academia, you know, anyone can find those. Um, and I, I feel like it's very hard to hold an information advantage for recent things. You know, the most you can hope for is that you've studied things for a long time and, and you have remembered some of them. Does that compel you to go the other way? That in a world where information travels incredibly quickly, you feel really pressured to create projects that will themselves travel quickly, that are easy to understand at a glance by the kind of person who just arrives at the project via Twitter link. And I don't know that that's a good thing. I'm not sure it's a bad thing either, but it's probably not neutral. I think we, we're only back of this. I mean, it's very interesting to think about how art is viewed, that if you um, think about art in a museum, People who come there, I mean, sure, people walk past projects all the time in museums, but at the same time, they're in a museum, they're there to kind of concentrate to some degree. On the other hand, if you have work on the web, people just have 10 different tabs open, they're doing three things at once, and they come to the site and they really need something that grabs them. And I think trying to keep that attention is something that everyone who's working in creative coding on the internet probably feels to some extent. And whether it improves work, I, I don't know. Um, it's, po it's possible that the short attention span of the net is one of the best editors we've all ever had. Um, I mean, for me, I've loved the idea of just sort of connecting things to astronomy. Astronomy is something that since I was very little, I've, I've been, I've, I've, you know, been in love with and spent a lot of time thinking about. And to me, the night sky is like just, you know, not only is it beautiful, it's the best metaphor ever for all sorts of things. So I, I love 
Exactly. I mean, in fact, there's a second project that I did for them um, called Spiral that basically arranged all of the posts in this sort of spiral view. And to me, this is a really interesting example of a fun failure, that there was a certain point, I would say, in the late 90s where we had the technology to pretty much do anything that we imagined, but nobody quite knew what worked functionally. Um, you know, not so much aesthetically, but just what would people like, what would be useful. And as a result, there were all these great sort of explorations of how you could navigate things. I mean, nothing was set. Like today, you know, navigation on a website is, is always on the left-hand side. But I remember there was a time where it was equally well on the right-hand side or left-hand side. Nothing was set. It was sort of like the, you know, Cambrian explosion and evolution where like all these weird slimy creatures emerged with, you know, with seven eyes or whatever. And then nature realized, okay, we can't have things with seven eyes. It doesn't work. But it was sort of this fun period. So with Spy fun period. So with Spiral, I remember being fascinated by this, by this idea of zooming. And I realized, okay, there are two ways that people typically look at time or space. They'll sort of zoom in directly or they'll pan left or right. One thing that has not been explored in terms of rigid transformations is just spiraling in. Um, so I made a whole um, interface that was based on that. It let you kind of go in and out at different speeds. I have to say it was not super functional. I remember watching people use it at a museum and sort of like, having this facepalm moment of, okay, this is really hard to use, actually. But at the same time, I think it was beautiful. And for me, there was a certain beauty and pleasure in just exploring that kind of interaction, doing a sort of interaction that I'd never seen before. Um, so uh, it's very hard, though, to get it right. And certainly, you know, if, if um, you're working at a company and want to create things that are actually useful to people, you know, you, you want to be on the useful edge. <laughs> um, I think for me, actually, one of the trickiest places to be often is the useful and interesting, but not beautiful. And I've actually had a couple of experiences of creating tools internally, um, you know, for, for business needs that I feel like are not really that aesthetically pleasing. Um, you know, you might you would never put them in a museum. You know, you never look at them and just say, oh, wow, that's cool. But for the people who are using that data, it's the best possible way to present the data. And that often is a little bit tricky um, if you're sort of a, a standard creative coder type because you really want the output of what you do to be gorgeous. You want people to think it's cool at some level. At the end of the day, it's like if all people want is to get things done, there are times when you just want to make it useful and you have to kind of rein yourself in. Um, but writing, where there are times where you just need to write something very simply and concisely and you don't put in elaborate metaphors, you strike out all the adjectives. And that's actually good discipline, even if you are eventually going to write very flowery prose which is Flickr flow. So Fernanda and I created this visualization of the seasons across Boston uh, by taking uh, images from Flickr that were pictures of the Boston Common. And then we extracted the colors so we could see at any given time of year, you know, how much red is there, how much green, how much white. And then we arranged this in this wheel that ended up showing very clearly sort of the ebb and flow of the seasons. You know, winter was really <laughs> white and gray. And during spring, you could see these bright colors for flowers. It was very, very picturesque. The truth, uh, and th this is a very good example of how you can use counting and numeric thinking to understand something that otherwise would be totally ethereal. Is that you know the English language? You know, it's this sort of mysterious, cloudy object out there, and yet you know there's just so many words, a, a limited number. You can fit them all on the screen at once, and there's something. There's like a feeling of power you get when you see it. You're like, this is it. You know, this is all the things we know how to talk about in a single word. Um, and it, I think it also gives you respect for sort of the power of language, for the power of syntax, that we can say everything we want with just, you know, these few blocks. Yeah, you inquiries. I think exploring language appeals to me just because there's something paradoxical about making language visible. So it's not an easy problem to solve. Um, and in, in a sense, I think it's actually unsolvable. But I think there are all these really interesting attempts you can make. So one of the things that... Um, I, part of the reason I'm fascinated by language as a target is because it is so powerful. You know, there, it's right now, there's actually this interesting debate going on about the role of sort of visual thinking versus verbal thinking. It's kind of a perennial debate in programming circles. Um, you see people who like 
you know, graphical user interfaces and other people like command line user interfaces, and you can make strong arguments for both. I think the right answer is they're both good at certain things. Um, way of saying that I think words are extremely powerful. They're an important way of thinking. And so getting, by visualizing words, we can start to visualize a whole realm of thought and a realm of knowledge that would be impossible if we just stuck to, you know, pure images or, or numbers. Also pausing. Uh, you know, computer code is not like the English language. Um, at the same time, I feel like computer code and the English language have a lot more, you know, together are very close in the grand scheme of things. That uh, uh, words, I think, are closer to formulas. They're closer to computer code. And I think the magical thing about words is that you can conjure up sort of an infinity of things very easily um, with words. Um, in computer code, you can create a loop that does a thousand things at once, or a million, or a billion. It's basically the same code. Um, in a diagram, like how are you going to diagram a quadrillion things? Like you can't really do it. Um, so, um, so words give you access to vast things, to infinite things, um, and really that's, that's part of the power. Um, it's also part of the reason they're bad is that, you know, it's, it can be very deceptive. Like you'll see an article in a newspaper about, um, you know, the federal budget or something. And basically it takes just as long to talk about something that's a million dollars as a billion dollars. And so you lose proportionality. So one of the great things about visualization and um, sort of graphical thinking is that you can see very directly importance and size. One of the great things about verbal thinking is that you can talk about things no matter what the size very easily. So there, there's a, a, a really, there's a duality, you know, they each have strengths and weaknesses, um, and I think we need both. Mm. So, you know, big data is, it's a funny phrase. It's, it's a very pithy phrase. It's very catchy. Um, I was in Brazil, and I was looking at a, a, a magazine in, in Portuguese, and because it was about big data, and it, it struck me that they, they didn't translate the phrase big data. Like, it was just big data, you know? <laughs> um, and it's one of those things, like, that I guess is untranslatable or so good in the original you want to keep it. Um, and I, I think the appeal about big data is that there's something there where it's enough data, it's like a big telescope. Um, and it, in some ways, I feel like that's a good way to think about it. Let's, let's use an astronomy metaphor, that if you're looking at, at, at the stars or a nebula or a galaxy, um, the bigger the lens of your telescope, the more light you can gather and the fainter signals you can perceive and the finer resolution you can get. Um, and I think with data, there's a very similar thing. And, and this is more about statistics than visualization, that the more data you have, the more statistical power you have. And you can start to pick out very, very faint signals. One of the best examples, kind of an emblematic example for me, is how um, certain kinds of machine translation work, where just by looking at parallel corpora, so you've got, you know, you have a whole bunch of texts, you know what it is in English, you know what it is in French, you can analyze that, if you have enough of it, to understand a lot about translation without knowing anything about syntax, anything about the underlying meaning. And if you only had two books to compare, like one book here and one book there in translation, there's no way that a computer could use those to learn how to translate from English to French. But it turns out if you have zillions of books, of zillions of texts, you suddenly can pick up these very, very faint, subtle signals with enough power that you can actually translate things really well. So I think that's the appeal of big data. It's just a bunch of astronomers talking about big telescopes. It lets you sort of pick up faint signals. Um, else, And I think one of the things that um, I like about our current era is that statistics is becoming something that everyone is starting to think about. You know, there's this you know, famous quote that statisticians repeat endlessly from, from Halvarian about statistics being the next sexy profession. Um, and I think that's, you know, it's, it's, it's funny because it's true because, you know, it, it is suddenly really glamorous for people who they call themselves data scientists. And I think that's really good. I think the more that it becomes part of the culture, the more that we'll all as citizens be able to make informed decisions. Um, the more that people understand the difference between a median and the mean, the better equipped we are to think about issues like income inequality. And so to me, I think to the extent that visualization can serve as a kind of gateway drug to statistics and can interest people in thinking quantitatively and statistically, I think it's serving this, this higher purpose for citizenship. So I think 
The biggest question is how can we make people more smart about thinking about numbers and thinking about issues in general. And I think visualization is part of that. Um, you know, it helps you sort of make calculations with complicated things by with your eyes instead of your brain, so to speak. Um, but it's not the, the end game. It's like, how do you get people engaged? You know, I think there's this question of, I, I sort of believe that everyone is really, really smart at the core, but we're only smart about things that we pay attention to. And so, I think the real question for visualization and for really anything in this realm is how do you direct people's attention? How do you get people to just think for a minute?